to find the reading in the book of Luke. Chapter 13. Verse 22. He went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? He said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many I say unto you, will seek to enter in, and shall not be able. And once the master of the house is risen up, and to shut to the door, and begin to stand without, and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. He shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence you are. Then shall you begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not from whence you are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. May we pray. Our Father, tonight, we lay bare our hearts and ask you to search them and see if there's any wicked ways in us and cleanse us and purge us that we may be able to worship you tonight in spirit and in truth. Thank you for every church that's represented here. Thank you for every preacher that's come tonight. God, may this be a time when we preachers will be strengthened and encouraged to stand and to keep standing. We pray, Heavenly Father, tonight that you'll revive those of us that are saved and save the lost. Dear God, take thy servant, loose his tongue, illuminate his mind, give us holy unction. And when we're ready to leave tonight, may we leave conscious we've been where God was. For Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. You'll find the text in the book of Job. Job 31, 14. What then shall I do when God rises up, when he visiteth? What shall I answer him? What then shall I do when God rises up, when he visiteth? What then shall I answer him? I want to talk to you about the all-important question tonight. And that question is, when God rises up and visiteth you, what's going to be your answer to God? God deals with us as individuals, never as a crowd, never as a group, but he deals with us as individuals. And I want us to realize tonight, my friend, that we came into this world not to stay. This is not your permanent address. You're here temporarily. Some have less time to spend here than others. But you all came out of your mother's room headed to the graveyard. Rich, poor, intelligent, young and old and all kinds. Kings and queens and presidents and congressmen. Man is not. Death has no respect of persons. So as a result, you are headed to the graveyard and so am I, if Jesus tarry. I hope he doesn't, but if he does, then I'm headed to the graveyard. So are you. We came into this world headed to the graveyard. And don't make any difference what you do in this world, how you live in this world, who you are in this world. You're not going to stay here. Amen. This is not your permanent living quarters. Amen. You're just here to prepare for the next place. Amen. So as a result, we're all headed out, regardless of what you believe, 
It don't make any difference what you believe nor what you think or say. You're still headed out. So as a result, it is appointed on the man wants to die, tell us in the book of Hebrews 9.27, it is appointed on the man wants to die, and after death, the judgment. Now that's two appointments you and I are going to keep. One of them is death. The other one is facing God's judgment. So as a result, it don't make them who you are, how you've lived or haven't lived, what you've done or haven't done, you're going to die, and after death, then you're going to face the judgment. So that's settled. Argue with it if you want to, it still doesn't change it, it's still so. And so as a result, we're facing that. Nobody can escape it. No human never has escaped it. No human ever will escape it. Now, you may not keep any other appointments, but you're going to keep those two. One's death, and the other's the judgment. You may be unfaithful to all others, but that's two you're going to keep, and I'm going to keep. So as a result, we head it out. You're going to die. Don't argue. You're going to die. So am I. Lest the Lord comes. You're going to die. You're going to die. When? 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 You're going to die. When? So I don't know. I don't either. Therefore, we'd better get our business straightened up before it comes. Not any of you going to escape it. Is your business straightened up? Are you ready to face God? That's the question tonight. No one can prevent God from rising up. I don't believe in God. I don't care for this God stuff. That don't help you a bit, buddy. You're going to rise up and meet God anyhow. I don't believe in hereafter some heavens and hell. That don't help you with me. You're still going to face God. When God rises up and pays you a visit, what then are you going to answer God? You can't prevent. There's no power in this universe that can prevent God from rising up. God will rise up and require an account of your stewardship and mine. Listen to it. Here we go. Romans fourteen eleven. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Who's going to give an account to God? Everyone himself. Amen. You're not going to give an account of First Red John Milton or Richard Horn. You're going to give an account of yourself before God. Amen. How many? Everyone. Now then, you say, I don't believe that. That don't change it. Because we go back in the book of Isaiah, and we read these words. God talking. I have sworn by myself. The word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. That unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. What he said? God said, I have said it, and I took an oath to it. That every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess. So it don't make any difference who you are, what you are, what your state of thinking is. There's two things. Your knee's going to get out before God one of these days, and that blasphemous, defined, God-hating tongue's going to confess Jesus Christ is God. 
Nobody's going to escape that one. Then let's look also in Philippians 2. It says something also. Second chapter of Philippians, 10th verse. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow on things in earth, things in heaven, and things under the earth. And that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Who made your tongue? Who made your knees? If he made them, he can bend them. He can make it work. You say, oh, I don't think God created me. I think I sprung from a monkey. Well, you don't belong to the human family. Anyhow, you won't have to bow. Like some time ago, an athlete uh, got hurt, and he'd been teaching evolution, saying we're all sprung from monkeys, and they sent over and wanted me to get up and announce that seven men go to the hospital right quick and give seven pints of blood. He had to have seven pints of blood. I said, I'm not going to do it. Go get seven monkeys and pump them into him. God made your tongue. God made your knee. And he can put your knee down any time he wants to. And he can make your tongue talk when it don't want to talk. So God's going to rise up and pay each one of us a personal visit. And each one of us is going to give an account of our own selves to God. What then shall you answer him when he rises up and visits you? I don't believe, that don't make any difference what you don't believe. You've got to bend your knee and bow your tongue and confess to God. And you've got to acknowledge everything you've done or haven't done. I don't care what you think, and I don't care what you believe and what you preach and what you teach, buddy. There's one thing coming one of these days, them proud knees of yours will hit down and your tongue will flap. It's coming. It always has. It always will. So I don't believe it. That don't change it. They didn't believe it's coming in a flood and noise. They got drowned just the same. They didn't believe it's going to rain brimstone and fire down on Sodom. It got burned up just the same. 250 smart elements out on the hillside laughed that God didn't believe. God can do anything. He split the earth open under the feet. They went to hell in their shirt tails before they ever knew what hit them. Regardless of what they believe. And my friends, we stop to realize something else. He said, Is thou not considered? In the book of Job, we find these words in the 22nd chapter, I believe. We find these words. Has thou marked the old way which wicked men have trodden? which were cut down out of time, whose foundation was old form of the flood. He said, Have you not noticed how that God cut down wicked men out of time and their foundations overflown with the flood? When God gets ready to flood, when God gets ready to cut down, ain't nobody can stop the flood because he controls the elements. By him and for him is all things created. And he created you to honor him. Now, if you've lived your life for the world and the devil in sin, what are you going to answer him when he rises up and pays your personal visit? Yes, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, and it is a point that a man wants to die after death comes to judgment. Hey, 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 you're headed to the judgment, I'm headed to the judgment, and we don't know when. We can go any time. We're living in a marvelous age in America. We got blood banks. Your blood goes bad. They pump it out and give you some good. You keep it going. Got our banks. Your eyes go bad to get somebody else's good eyes put in. You keep seeing. Got kidney banks. Your kidneys go bad. And they take your kidney out and put in a new one. And you keep going. Wait a minute. 
They ain't got no breath bank shit. They're rationed. And you just get one at a time. And if God decides to withhold the next one, you reach for it. <sighs> Who's going to bend God's big arm and make him hand you another one? We're headed to death and the judgment. And then God's going to make us bend our knees and with our tongues tell what we've done or haven't done. Are you ready to face God? If God grown, grown the breath on you tonight and you have to face God, what then will you answer God? When you face Him, what then shall you answer Him? My friends, if there's any doubt about God's judgment, just look at the past experiences of men. Is it not in harmony with reason that man should be rewarded or punished according to his works? And on no other basis. On no the basis we can be judged according, my friends, is on our works. Punished according to our works or rewarded? Some of the questions are, how have you lived? For God. Not in how John's lived or Bill's lived, how you lived. How you living now? That's what you don't have to answer to God for, how you living now. You say, well now, Mr. Ray, I just don't have time to live for God, that's a lie. I'm on to you live to be 60 years old, sleep 8 hours a day, you'll sleep 20 years of the 60. You eat 3 meals a day, using 30 minutes for each meal, you'll eat 4 years. You start to work when you're 20 years old, and work 40 hours a week, and not miss a single week, you work 9 and a half years of the 60. You go to Sunday school, and preaching, and training union, and preaching, and Wednesday night prayer meeting, every Sunday, every Wednesday night, without missing a single service, you'll spend all the one and a half years in the church. So you sleep 20 years, you eat four years, you work nine and a half years, you spend one and a half years in the church, add all of this up, and you've lived only 35 years of the 60, so you still have 25 years without anything to do. Now quit lying. <laughs> now you may not know you're lying, but God knows you're lying when you say, I don't have time to serve God. There it is, figured out in plain black and white. So don't go out and say, I don't have time. You're just uh, lying, and you're lying. Folks don't, uh, you may think folks don't know it, but to do, you don't want to mess up. <laughs> I'd get me some other little alibi for not serving God. I wouldn't lie about it. I'd just say, I don't do it because I don't want to. That's the reason you don't. <laughs> so as a result, my friends, how have you lived? How have you treated the church of the living Son of God? Have you spent your time criticizing the church, criticizing the preachers, criticizing the deacons, criticizing the singers, criticizing the teachers, or have you spent your time trying to have a revival in your community? Have you spent your time running around trying to get the a uh, little piece of trash out of the other fellow's eye when you had a saw log in your own eye? Face it tonight. How have you spent your time? Have you been causing divisions and confusion and strife in the churches where you go to? God said that's earthly and sensual and devilish when you do that. And when you try to drag in some strange doctrine and when you try to there's still confusion, division, strife, 
You are earthly and sensual and devilish. That's all you are. So face the truth. You're going to have to face God, not preacher Ed, preacher Horn, or preacher Milton, or somebody else. You're going to have to face God with it. What are you going to answer God when you get up there and you've been nothing but a murmur and a belly ache and complainer? What are you going to answer God for having hurt the church with your criticism and your fault finding and your, your indifference toward it? What are you going to answer God, honey, when you face Him? Yes, your tongue's going to confess, your knee's going to bow, and He's going to open your book, and you're going to fess up then. What are you going to say? What are you going to, when God rides up and visits you, what then shall you answer him for all of that stuff? Then, as the result, and then I know all of that, so what in has your life been answered according to the purpose of God? You go up there, you had to serve God. Your feelings are hurt. You're mad. You have unforgiveness. And you've been sitting at home with David sitting for the devil rocking your feelings. Somebody hurt your little feelings and you took them home. I'm not going to go back up there and let them hurt you no more. I'll keep you home. Some of you have spent ten years rocking your little feelings. The devil has given you a little baby to rock and you're rocking it. And baby, setting is an awful deal. Because the longer you set with a baby, the more attached you get to it. And it's awful confining. And it's awful poor pay. <laughs> and the devil gives you some baby to quit your church and go home and rock. And the preacher and the leaders of the church come around and try to get you back. Oh, I just can't give it up. I got hurt. I just can't give it up. I'm just loving so good. I'm going to stay with it. Go ahead. And you can't go nowhere for babysitting for the devil. That's right. And as a result, you're confined and you're full of uh, ulcers and have spiritual indigestions and everything else. You've missed the boat all the way around. And then when you go to get your pay, you know what it is? Let me tell you what it is. You've been going around carrying that stuff till it's nearly broke you down. And when you get to the pearly gate, God will say, unload that mess outside. You're not coming in with it. <laughs> We've got a bunch of Baptists been hauling around hurt feelings and baby stuff the devil's given. For all these years, 15, 20 years, you get to the front of the gate, God say, I'm over right there, you can't come in. That's kind of pay you got, honey. What are you going to answer God when you took out on God because somebody didn't do right, the preacher didn't do right, the deacon didn't do right, and you took out on God? You didn't agree to serve the preacher and the deacon when you come into church, you agreed to serve God. Now, God ain't mistreated you. God had not hurt you. So why take out on God? Call somebody after the phone. What are you going to answer God? When you get up there, my friends, and God calls you to the, uh, to the stand, what are you going to answer God then? That's what you got to face. Then... I say to you again, my friend, what has been your life? Has it answered the call to God? Is your influence for God and the church? Amen. The Lord loved the church Amen. and gave himself for it. Amen. And he said, love one another. Be ye kind one to another. So as a result, what are you loving tonight? The church? Like the Lord loved it? Or are you loving honky tonks, beer joints, nightclubs, dance halls, pool halls, gambling dens, 
different things out in the world, the beaches and the mountains and the lakes and the athletics and the clubs. Who are you serving tonight, friend? Who, what do you love tonight? Do you love the church more than you love these other things? What are you going to answer? Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. Are you loving the church and giving yourself for it? Then if you're not, you can't expect a revival. And you can't cuss the folks in Washington, the presidents, and the congressmen for not doing anything. They ain't got the... You're the priest. I told you that last night. You're the ones that get in here and do the praying. That bunch can't get in. They can't pray. And if you don't get in and pray, the whole thing's going to hell. And if you're living out in the world, you don't want to get there because you ain't got on your white linen witches. You're afraid God will kill you. What you. What's your influence for tonight, ladies and gentlemen? Is it for the church and the kingdom of God? Or is it for the place of the world and the things of the world? What are you using your influence and your talent for? Well, you're going to have to face God. I just well let you face it now. You'll face it anyhow. And some of you might have sense enough to listen to the preaching and get straightened out. I'll tell you now. But that's going to be too late. You won't have a time. You've got a chance now to straighten up and get back right. Get in your church and start living for God and working for God. But if you took out on your church, what are you going to answer God when he rises up and dishes you? What's going to be your answer? You say, but preacher, I got an excuse. God said you'll be without an excuse. He said because of the manifestation of the eternal Godhead in creation, man will be without excuse in that day. And God won't take none of your excuses. I want to drive that into you tonight. God will not take anybody's excuses. Table was set. Some folks invited. One of them said, I'm married wife and can't come. Excuse me. Another said I bought a yoke ox and got crime. Excuse me. Another said I bought a piece of pup and got crime. And the master said, go out in the highways and and get somebody that will come in. The table's ready. Yeah. got to feed them. And they went out in the highways and hedges and come in and fill up the table for the supper. Now here's what I want you to get. The master said, these that were bidden and refused to come were not worthy of the supper. That's it. But what's worse is the next part of the verse. These that were bidden and did not come were not worthy of the supper. Neither shall they ever eat of the supper. And when you start putting your wife and your oxen and bolts and fishing equipment and skin equipment and a bunch of other junk between you and your church and your God, you done got yourself where you're not fit to eat supper. God said you'd never eat of it. Well, that's the book. So I'm saying, what are you giving your talent? Your time and your influence too tonight, ladies and gentlemen, lads and lasses. Where are you spending your influence for? What are you spending your talents for? What are you spending your time for? For the Lord God Almighty and His church or for the world and the devil's business? Then if that's the case, what's your answer, God, when He rises up and bisses you? What are you going to answer Him, honey? Not only that, your influence has been for worldly things and worldly places. A lot of worldly stuff instead of for the church and the Lord. To what end has your life been been used of God? Have you employed your talents for God or the devil? You've gone out and lending your talents to the clubs and the fraternities, the dance halls, the juke joints, and the in a painting world, or you put it in the church where God added you. Now, I'm talking to people tonight that God added to the church. He added you to the church because he needed you. 
and knew there was something in you that he needed, and so he added you to the church so he could have that that you needed. See? And you need to recognize that tonight. If he hadn't needed you, he wouldn't have pulled you in. He said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. And if it had been something about you, ladies and gentlemen, lads and lasses, that he needs you in the church for, he left you outside with the rest of the crowd. He left you. But are you fulfilling that for what he, he puts you in there, there for? You're not in danger. You won't use the talent, then God will take it away from you. I remember down in the state of Florida, I was down there in a meeting, and one night the music director, he's superintendent over a big paper mill, away. something happened, he had to leave the service over. The pastor's about to have a nervous, nervous breakdown because there wasn't nobody leave to sing. I said, well, preacher, don't have a nervous fit because I can preach it out singing. I have. I can do it again. He said, oh, what do people think? I said, forget it. And sure enough, it was about time for church and the music director gone. Just for church. Then his wife, real dressed up real fine, came in and about me the way. He said, you see them? I said, yeah. Said he used to lead the singing in this church about eight years ago, and he sung more people down now than the preacher ever preached. You get him sing now, it didn't really work. See, he won't sing fire since he's bad at me. So I went outside the side door and went around, come in the front door, and sit down by the side of him, pushed over a little, sat down beside him, and just talked to him. I said, Brother, the music you let have to go over to the plant is the emergency over there. And the preacher's about to have a fit because you got nobody to leave the singing. I understand you used to leave the singing in this church. I said, would you come and lead it tonight to help us out of a tank? For Jesus' sake, would you do it? I said, come on now. What's the matter with you? He come and cry and said, I wish I could. I said, well, preacher, you don't know me. But eight years ago, I got mad at the preacher. And they wouldn't get rid of him, and I got mad at the deacons because they wouldn't. And then I got mad at the church, and I quit, and uh, I took out on God, and I got the bad throat, and I went to the doctor today, and he told me I had cancer of the vocal cord, and I wouldn't leave him for three months. He said, if I could, I would have hope. I came, I came, and I said, sorry, sir. And he couldn't. His soul was heat up with a cancer. I went on down and preached. I got through. I said, we got no music, but we'll just stand having an invitation. Anybody want to come? Come on. Little old boy come running down the aisle, freckled face, freckled hands, barefooted, patched clothes. He's so timid. I'd try to get to him night or two to speak to him. He'd run from me. He's so timid. He run down the aisle and told his little old arms around me and looked up my face, and he was shining like a deacon light. He said, I... Jesus wants me to pre sing tonight, preacher. I said, well, good. You surrender to be a singer when you grow up. I said, grow up nothing. He wants me to do it now. I looked at the preachers and they gave it that. The deacons gave it that. That meant no. I said, then, son, you come. You surrender to be a singer when you grow up for Jesus. And when you do, you grow up a little bigger. You'll be a singer. He said, that ain't what I said. I said, Jesus wants me to sing right now. Right here. I said, okay, go for it. I said, you want the lady to play the piano? He said, I don't know about that thing. He didn't tell me how it played. He told me the same. I said, go to it. Got his little hands up in the air and his face broke out with a glow. Started to sing. And before he got through the first stage of 19 of the wickedest men in town, he threw off and he got saved. You know what happened? I tell you what happened. God went back there and took the talent out of that old rebellious song leader who'd been rebelling on God for eight years, put in that little boy and turned him loose. God ain't got time for you to sit down and pout and take out. God's moving on. God's moving on. God's moving on. What are you going to tell God if you took out? Yeah. You quit your church that he added you to. 
and give you something to do in that and you took out and quit. Hey, hey, what are you going to tell God when he visits you? What are you going to tell God? You had a burden for prayer. You've lost your burden because you got your world and kernel. You can't pray and you quit praying. What are you going to tell God? God rise up and this is you. Do you what is your present status with God? Are you standing with God and with your church? Or you stand with a crowd that's against God and against the church? What is your status tonight, ladies and gentlemen? If God draws that last breath out of your carcass, then you face God for the break of day. What's going to be your answer? What status is yours tonight? Are you for the church? For God? For revival? Or are you full of rebellion and nakedness and lewdness and sin? A lot of you rebelling on God. He said, let the women be dressed in modest apparel, and you are fighting God and running around here naked. Yeah. Running around in your shorts and your halters, claiming you love God. God can't use that carcass all messed up like that. How would you like to live in a house? With all the weatherboard and all full foot and ceiling, nothing but the framework standing there. Everybody come along peeping in. Your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, and He don't want all these whip, split dresses and shorts and halters and bikinis and what have you, letting folks come along and peep in. Why do you go ask a God for where you've undressed? Why do you go ask a God for the way you've dishonored your body? You men that would let yourselves get slouchy, hair grow like women. So many men wearing long hair now, God, according to the medical magazine, God's fixing to let men start giving milk from their nipples. Men who are well boys who are wearing long hair beginning to have breast cancer. How do you like that? You want to be a woman? God's going to fix you up like one. You're not doing nothing but copping ass a bunch of dirty needles that come over here and disgrace this country. Went off into the rock music and the festival music and the devil's music and America fell in. And then they go barefooted and trot and stink like goats and look like tramps. Yeah. My Lord's not made up of that caliber. Yeah. And that's what's hurting America tonight is the slouchiness and the filthiness and the sexiness and all, the, all of your gays and all your lesbians and all of that has all come out of it. Yeah. Why did you answer God for parading your naked body around instead of being a godly person? Why did you to answer God because you rebelled on God and did what nature told you not to do? Why did you to answer God, fellas, when you face God? Ladies, why did you to answer God when he said, You spent your life trying to show your sexy carcass. You didn't try to show my son Jesus and magnify my church. Why are you going to answer God? Why are you going to answer God when you buy visit? My friends resisted. God said you're worse than a bunch of infidels. He that provides not for his own, and especially those of his own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. What you talking about? If you claim to be Christian, you daddies don't provide spiritual food for your family by taking them to church, 
Then I want you to remember one thing. God said you're worse than infidel. You run around talking about you believe in Christianity and believe in the church, but you don't support it with your presence and take your families there and support it with your presence and your prayers and your possessions. God said you're worse than infidel. I didn't say it. He said it and I preached it and there it is. Face it tonight. He said to obey is better than sacrifice and stubbornness and rebellion is worse than witchcraft and idolatry. And when you start resisting God's way and fighting God's way, you've got worse than an old witch and an idolatry. That's what God says and that's what it is. You said, well, Mr. A, I'll not hear you to preach no more. You won't forget the night you did, honey. <laughs> You say, I don't believe those things. You believe the biographies of men. You believe history. Why not believe the Word of God? And you weigh the evidences. My friends, why have you not loved God? Why have you not praised God? Why have you not worshipped God? Why have you forsaken the assembling of yourselves together? Why have you robbed God? You say, because I was depraved in my heart and my environment and the temptations, I just couldn't live for God. This is all true. But if you were a judge in a human court, would you accept and turn murders and rapers loose because they raised in, in bad environments? Not at all. You demand punishment. God said it's not your depravity, but rejection of a remedy. Not your guilt, but the refusal of a pardon. Not your circumstances and snares, but despising of his spirit. You can't hide from God. You can't evade God's visit. You can't contend with him. He'll have the last word. You can't fight with him. He'll have the last lick. He will not excuse you. My friends, on what grounds are you going to argue with God? I ask you, my friends, when you face it, David sinned against God. And as a result, David died, eat up with syphilis. His eyes eat out, his ears eat out, his vocal cords eat out, and died in isolation. Samson sinned against God and went away from God. And wouldn't do what God put him to do. He died, got his eyes pulled out. He got himself bound and ground at the enemy's mill. And Saul listened to what the people said and didn't do what God said. And Saul, God took the anointing off of Saul and turned evil spirits on him. And they made him kill himself, his sons wrecked, and so on. I say to you tonight, when God rises up, and this is you. What's going to be your answer for the way you live, for the way you've treated God's church, for the way you've acted in God's kingdom? What then shall be your answer when God rises up and this is you? What do you answer? <laughs> <laughs>